Welcome back to the Elite Performance Podcast. Today on the show, we have Dr. Ken Clark. Ken is one of the foremost leaders in the world on sprint research. And today we delve into much of his past literature and research involving speed and uh, sprint mechanics. We talk about everything from what makes a great accelerator to what makes a great top end speed sprinter. Are those characteristics and traits trainable? Uh, his thoughts on sleds or resistance running and training. Also, his thoughts on assisted or overspeed training. We get into basically everything you can think of up from technical, mechanical principles of acceleration, top end speed, where strength lies uh, in developing speed, and a number of other things that um, he is doing this year with his teams, his athletes um, that he works on, not only in speed, but also agility goes into a little bit. So it is a truly a great episode. Uh, Ken gives some great detail in his answers, some great responses. We get some good. Um, follow-up questions, um, which we got to really get into the nuts and bolts of a lot of what Ken uh, um, does with his athletes and also what the literature tells us on how to help our athletes uh, become faster and maximize their speed potential. So it was just a wonderful episode. Please, as always, if you gain anything from this, please give Ken a shout-out on, on Twitter, uh, at Ken Clark Speed, and give us a follow as well. And um, share this podcast on the, your social media website of choice, so others can hear the great knowledge that uh, Ken has to share. So without further ado, let's go ahead and meet with Ken. Welcome back to the Elite Performance Podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. Ken Clark. Ken, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Let's get right to it. Let's Tell us a little bit of, uh, of your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, uh, probably like just about every other performance coach out there, uh, you know, I had a, a sports background myself. Um, Played uh, football and baseball growing up and uh, uh, played those two sports in high school. Uh, played Division three college football like yourself. Uh, I was a running back at Swarthmore College and, uh, you know, it was never uh, gifted with a, a ton of athletic ability. So I was always just trying to get faster myself. Uh, genetically, I was probably about a 4940, which uh, at five foot seven just isn't going to cut it. So uh, I, I was always trying to get faster, trying to get that 49 down to a 46, and really just kind of piqued my interest in in speed development. And uh, you know, my my father also was a a high school football coach and a and a um, you know a speed coach on the side. So um, so we were always working together. It was always. Uh, always just kind of us in the summer times working on a 40 and we even had a little training company called speed science that he ran and I took it over when I graduated college. So I, th I think to a certain extent, uh, my, my destiny was sealed from a young age. <laughs> Absolutely. And like you said, uh, from a young age, you were kind of groomed with speed and that's kind of what you're known for uh, as you know, uh, a leader in the speed and sprint research. So talk about some of the areas that you've delved into with your, your speed and uh, research. Yeah, so I, I guess mostly over the last five or six years, um, it's kind of comparative research about what makes elite sprinters fast versus kind of average Joes not so elite. And I think when you uh, analyze runners across the spectrum, it, it really highlights some, some differences and you can really gain a lot of insight from, from doing comparative research that way. So uh, I was lucky enough to do my doctoral studies with Dr. Peter Wayand in the locomotive performance lab down at uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas. I was there from 2010 to 2015 before moving back up to the Philly area uh, where I currently am. But um, really what we, what we looked at is, um, okay, if we bring Olympians into the lab and we look at their sprint mechanics, their top speeds, um, their technique, the, the forces that they apply to the ground, and then we look at team sport athletes like soccer players or lacrosse athletes. And then we look at average Joes. What, what makes these three different types of athletes different? And what we found uh, was, was really neat that essentially there are, uh, of course, physical differences across that spectrum. But in addition to that, which I think all of us intuitively know, there's technique differences in terms of um, their posture, their leg mechanics, how they contact the ground that um, results in 
greater amount of forces being delivered from those elite runners, and which ultimately leads to, to greater speeds, whether you're looking at top speed or acceleration. And I know we're going to get into to both of those areas in a minute. Um, but, but just to kind of summarize it, it, it really allowed us to um, come up with these across the spectrum insights as to, okay, when we have our gold medalists versus our weekend warriors, what differentiates, uh, you know, these types of runners? Yes. Um, off top here a little bit, but, you know, with, with what you said, you worked under Peter Wayne, and he seems to be, from the outside view, there seems to be this vertical versus horizontal force production yeah. debate in the sprint, you know, world. You know, being that you worked underneath Peter Wayne, what, what was his take? I mean, I know it's always better to hear from the horse's mouth rather than outsiders kind of maybe taking his research and, you know, you know, taking their own conclusions, but what does he feel on that topic versus uh, vertical forces versus horizontal forces? Yeah, well, I, I won't put words in, in Peter's mouth, but um, I can only speak to this, you know, for, for all types of speed, whether, whether you're talking about acceleration or, or top speed, um, you know, I, I think there's really kind of three overarching, overarching rules. Um, you need to generate as much force as possible relative to your body mass. You need to transmit that force to the ground as rapidly as possible, and you need to apply the force in the, in the correct direction. Um, so if we're talking acceleration, you know, clearly horizontal force is important because you need to push back to propel yourself forward. But uh, I think the, the one thing that sometimes gets overlooked is the primary component of acceleration is always that you apply enough vertical force down into the ground to support your body weight. So um, in my mind, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, you know, of a fun argument to have, but also one that's kind of pointless. Uh, and I, I've been on record as saying that before, just because the, the leg doesn't necessarily know which direction you're pushing. It, it just flexes and extends and, and, you know, you lean in to accelerate and then at, at top speed, your posture's upright. Um, both types of forces are, are incredibly important, um, both vertical and, and, of course, horizontal forces for acceleration. And then when you, when you get up to top speed, as, as we'll talk about, you know, then the, then the forces become um, mostly, mostly vertical. Um, and, you know, it's important to train uh, both types of forces to, to improve somebody's speed. So when the rubber meets the road it, it, and we're always in the, you know, with, with the goal of trying to get our athletes faster, you definitely have to work on both aspects of the race, which in part means training both horizontal and vertical forces. So. Good. Yeah. So let's start with acceleration. What qualities make up a great accelerator? Yeah. So, you know, if we, we go back just briefly to those rules, all right, as much force as possible relative to your body mass, transmit that force quickly and, and apply the force in the right direction. Um, you know, from a technique standpoint, I really see it as, as four major things. Posture, posture, and posture is that first rule. Because if you lose that posture, uh, during acceleration, you're, you're never going to be able to regain that posture at any other point in the sprint. So whether we're talking an, uh, an Olympic 100 meter athlete or if we're talking a soccer player on the pitch, you got to have a strong neutral posture um, from your head all the way through the leg that's applying force through the ground. Uh, most importantly, as it relates to posture, you know, the, the hips have to be neutral. The pelvis has to be neutral. And I, I think one mistake I see a lot is you, you can't have the athlete try to run low. So, you know, trying to bend at the waist for, for trying to feel like the athlete is running low or to try to look like the athlete is running low is in, in some cases a, a cardinal sin. The, the body angle is going to be determined by the amount of force that the athlete can deliver to the ground and, and not the other way around. So having a strong neutral posture is rule number one for acceleration technique. Number two, um, piston-like leg action. And again, this is no uh, you know, secret, um, but the, the leg action at top speed is, is more uh, cyclical or circular uh, naturally than it is during acceleration, especially the first two to three steps. Those legs got to function like big old scissors, just flexing and extending as powerfully as possible, working like big pistons. Um, when, the, when the foot hits the ground, so kind of rule number three for acceleration, the contact has to be extremely stiff. So it needs to be kind of made on the front part of the foot. 
Um, you know, in, in the SMU lab, we always say we always used to say strike on the track spike, so to speak. So on the on the ball, the foot, on the front part of that uh, that track spike, and it needs to be stiff. So in other words, there can't be any energy leaks, to use a common coaching term, or any instability from the ground through the stance leg, through the hips, through the torso. Everything's got to be rock solid. And then lastly, I, and I think this one is is sometimes overlooked in acceleration. Um, the leg recovery needs to be front side dominant. And, and so what that means is if you kind of draw a, a plumb line from the head down through the torso and you extended that plumb line um, back, uh, you know, down through the athlete's legs, you wouldn't want to see that thigh really drift too far behind the torso in the leg recovery. And that's really uh, obvious during top speed when the athlete's posture is more vertical and, uh, and upright. But during acceleration, I think sometimes that concept gets lost. So what I mean is the athlete is leaning forward, uh, you know, at a 45 degree angle or a 60 degree angle. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the leg, especially the thigh, should drift back behind the, the body. It should still be this powerful front side recovery so that they can cock the hammer and strike the nail even during acceleration. So just to, just to summarize there, acceleration technique, um, rule one, posture, 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 rule two, piston leg action, rule three, stiff ground contact on the ball of the foot, rule, th rule uh, four, powerful front side recovery. And I think included in that is, is kind of a big split between the thighs. Uh, one thing I look for with my athletes, especially in the first two to three steps, more than a 90 degree split between the thighs, that, that lets me know that they're really getting that kind of piston leg action and powerful front side recovery. So. Awesome, awesome, that was great stuff. Let's, let's break those down just a little bit. So many of the listeners, myself included, work with a lot of you know, high school athletes. So number one, their posture, like you said, I see a lot of athletes that, whether they've been just reinforced through you know, maybe wrong coaching growing up to stay low. So they're, like you said, they're, they're bent at the hips. Um, how do you, you know, what's your favorite method or, you know, how do you go about improving that posture to give them the feel, the correct, you know, head to heel, strongest feel that, that long neutral, you know, body alignment? Yeah. Uh, great question. So I think some of the, you know, just the kind of classic wall piston drills can be good just to, you know, set the framework and give them that feel. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, more than five minutes of any given session should maybe be dedicated towards those because I do think that you need to get, um, you know, on the track and actually run to get the transfer. But I think starting out a session with those is good. Um, I think some partner resisted or sled resisted drills are, are good because to a certain extent providing that, um, you know, constraint essentially allows the athlete to get into that position while still marching, skipping, or running. Um, but then I think to a large degree, uh, it just comes from getting the athlete stronger relative to their body weight. So um, not necessarily coaching them to run low, just kind of letting them run naturally. And then as they get stronger relative to the body weight, and as they're able to deliver more mass specific force down and back into the track, the force is going to dictate the body angle if, it, if it's allowed to just occur naturally. So I, I suppose for the, you know, the coaches who are listening, I would say um, maybe avoid coaching the, the run low cue and, and maybe more just kind of set the framework with the wall drills or with the, the sled and the partner drills. And then look to what you're doing in the weight room and really work on getting them stronger relative to the body mass. And then it should transfer to the track. Uh, provided they're doing just, uh, you know, enough normal two, three, or four-point sprints um, to, to work on general starting technique. Great. Number two, the, the piston-like leg action. Again, a lot of younger athletes or even, you know, some athletes like to be more cyclical during acceleration. But obviously, the other end of the spectrum is kind of that, that toe drag, I guess, you know. So how many <laughs> yeah. athletes that are more slick, cyclical during those first initial two steps – how do you get them to feel more of that piston-like leg action? Yeah, uh, another good question. So I, I think to a certain extent, um, it has to be communicated to the athlete to, to slow it down, which sounds really counterintuitive. But, uh, you know, just going for, for big pushes, not to rush it. And that can be a really tough thing. There's no doubt about it to a high school kid where, 
all they're thinking is, hey, I want to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible and, and just to spin the wheels in place. So I think, uh, you know, just queuing big pushes over and over and over again, just, just really hammering that. Uh, that queue or, or, you know, any others in, in that queue toolbox that, that are effective. And then just um, taking the clock off the athlete for, for that set of uh, acceleration drills. I, I think that can be a really important one and, and perhaps something I've had to learn the hard way. So if you're trying to, to fix that mistake and you're doing it while you're still timing the 10-yard dash or the 20-yard dash, and believe you me, I'm all in favor of timing uh, sprints and I do it you know, almost all the time. But if that's an error you're seeing, then you have to, and you have to do it in a non-timed setting so that the athlete isn't worried about running a good time. Because as soon as they're worried about running a good time, they're going to go right back to spinning the wheels because they think that's what's going to make them fastest. So, so take, the, take the, the, you know, the free lap or the Brower or whatever it is off of them, take the stopwatch off them, go back to just push, 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 and, and try to get them to slow it down a little bit. Great, great. The third one, stiff uh, ground contact time. So you talked about not having too much deformation at ground contact. So as a coach, you know, technically wise, are you looking for, is that, are you looking for like the how far much the heel collapses? You talked about, you know, hit on your spikes. Um, if you do see an athlete that is having a little bit too much deformation or losing that stiffness, is that a ankle stiffness problem or how you work about that? Or is it a technical problem? You know, what do you see in that front? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, work on it all the time. There's not a drill on the track or on the turf or in the weight room where this isn't something to, to look for and to coach. So stiff ground contact, in my opinion, can be drilled in every single warm-up drill, whether it's a march, whether it's a skip, um, you know, bound. It can be drilled whether you're working an acceleration day, a max velocity day. It can be work in your most um, – you know, low intensity plyometrics from an ankle bounce to jump rope to even your more intense plyometrics. Um, so I, I think it's something that you coach and you cue all the time. From a, from a correction standpoint, the foot rarely collapses uh, into the ground during acceleration, i.e. where the heel would contact the ground. With the body angle like it is, you have to have a really, really weak athlete for the heel to touch the ground. Now, hey, sometimes maybe that happens. And in that case, you just need to get the athlete stronger relative to their body mass. And that's kind of more of a weight room thing. But that, that only happens for a really um, developmental athlete who's weak in the acceleration phase. At, at top speed, sometimes you see the heel collapse more. So in my mind, it's something that you just coach and cue all, all day, every day with everything you do from a, from a speed standpoint. Um, and, and then if you see a deficiency in an acceleration, it might be something where you need to, yeah, train their underlying physical qualities um, at all the leg extensors, ankle, hip, and, and knee joints, um, you know, if an athlete's showing that in, in acceleration. We'll talk about that in top speed, which is a little bit of a different Perfect. story. You, you mentioned sleds already, and sleds are becoming more and more popular. Um, you know, J.B. Moran's group just came out with a, a paper that showed that heavier sleds were more effective for not only – uh, performance, but also technical improvements compared to lighter sleds. I, I think they use what 15% body weight, but this is a loaded question. So give us a little insight on the literature on sled training in terms of different loads, um, pulling. So like a harness versus your, uh, across your hips versus, you know, shoulders or even pushing like you're pushing a prowler. Yeah. So um, I, I think there's, uh, you know, obviously a lot of interest on, on sleds, both push and pull. Uh, it's a favorite topic of mine. It's actually what my master's thesis was on, was using uh, sled poles for, for max velocity. Um, we actually found that the, uh, in my master's thesis, which was way back in, in 2008, that sled pulling wasn't effective for improving max velocity. Now, it was field sport athletes. We were only, you know, using a relatively light load. Um, and, and I think a lot more of the recent research is focusing on, on acceleration and, you know, heavier loads, as you said. Um, I, I guess my overarching statement would be this. There's a lot that we still don't know. I, I love the concept of resisted sprint training for the acceleration phase because acceleration by nature is a push. You're leaning in and you're pushing back. So to me, the concept of using acceleration to, prove, to improve acceleration, uh, sorry, using uh, resisted sprint methods to improve acceleration makes a ton of sense. Um, 
you know, I think that some of the review papers uh, and other research by, by JB's group and others um, has maybe highlighted that, you know, a lot of the prior research has used resisted loads that are too light. And so um, I think that opens the doors for a lot of upcoming research on using much heavier loads, you know, even upwards of 60 to 100 percent of an athlete's body mass and, and seeing what the effects are. Um, I don't want to make too many conclusive statements now because I think that research is about to, you know, is about to come out or, you know, it's either ongoing or it's about to, to be uh, looked at. But I think there's a lot of potential there. And, and the reason is this, the athlete naturally gets into that heavily inclined position and it forces them to push back hard. And so in my mind, from a, from a mechanic standpoint, from a physics standpoint, um, that's a really good thing. As it um, relates to the waist harness versus kind of a push sled, again, there's, there's zero research on this that I know of to date. So I can't comment, well, you know, this study's found this or that study's found that. But um, I, I think there's pluses and minuses to both. I like the prowler or the push sleds because in my mind, they allow you to lean in without kind of the, the weight pulling from behind where you know maybe your hips get pulled back and it pulls you out of a out of a good postural position so just kind of anecdotally i think the push sleds allow for a little bit of a better posture um there's a lot of other good coaches that i've worked with who say that a waist harness or a, or a chest harness actually serves as a stimulus for the athlete to pull their hips into good position so not all coaches feel the way i do but anyways um I like the push sleds because I think they maybe allow you to, to uh, lean in a little bit better. On the other hand, they don't allow you to, to use your arms when you're accelerating. So I think one of the, you know, the counter benefits of using a waist harness or a, or a chest harness is that you can get resisted, you know, training using, using the arm drive. So I think there's pluses and minuses to both. And I think it's just highlights one of those areas where there needs to be more research done uh, right now. But, uh, you know, just to, to wrap up on that point, um, I think the potential for a lot of, a, a lot of benefit from really heavy loads is out there. Um, and I'm excited about, you know, some of the great research that, that's probably uh, going to be published in the next year or two looking into both of those push and pull sleds. So. Good. Now on the other end of the spectrum, kind of with the popularity of the 1080 sprint, what, what is there out there for say assisted or overspeed? Have you, have you delved into that a little bit in terms of um, the benefits or, or, you know, potentially downsides of overspeed training yeah uh, <laughs> uh so 1080 sprint came came to the smu lab uh twice while i was there we got to got to use it i got to have a a, a few high profile sprinters uh use it uh it's incredible instrumentation um i also have a couple of colleagues who, who own it that i'm going to be collaborating with at least unofficially um so I, I'm really excited to kind of see what can be done with that because I, I do think that overspeed is potentially the next frontier of, of max velocity improvement. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessary for developmental or intermediate athletes, and this is just pure speculation, absolutely speculation on my part. In my mind, for developmental and, and intermediate athletes, there's a lot that can be gained for them just by having them run fast, you know, get stronger, run fast, do some mechanical work, um, maybe like technical buildup drills or wicket drills, that sort of thing where you, where you don't need, you know, other assisted uh, speed or overspeed devices. But I, I think once you reach that elite type of level where the mechanics are good and they're strong enough relative to their body weight and you're kind of reaching the ceiling of what you can do using normal training methods, then I, then I do think that potentially, um, you know, overspeed using devices such as the 1080 sprint has some potential. Um, because frankly, max V is a, is a highly neurological, you know, phase. Uh, you got to apply as much force as possible, as fast as possible. So it, it's highly neural. And, and I think that, um, you know, the, the 1080 sprint, potentially offers the ability to really dial in exactly how much assistance we're, we're giving and at the exact correct points in the sprint. So with overspeed training that I did 
myself as an as an athlete way back in the day, you know, using the rubber band with my dad running out in front of me to the, the band training that I did a decade ago. You know, the issue is always you can't really dial it in that precisely. Um, you know, are there safety issues, that sort of thing. And I think that, that the 1080 offers, at least from what I've seen, the, the potential to overcome those challenges. So I'm excited to see in the next couple of years, um, you know, how it can be used to potentially reach, uh, you know, um, overcome the, the ceiling for kind of uh, elite level runners. So. Great. So you, you were shifting our gears now to Max V. Yeah. What are some of the qualities that make a great top end sprinter? Yeah. It, this is going to sound like a broken record from, from what I said in acceleration. Uh, but, but that's for a, a specific reason. Um, with a lot of the elite runners I got to work with down in Dallas and, and also here in the Philadelphia area, the thing I've noticed most, and this was kind of the aha moment for me back in about 2014, the strategy doesn't change from start, uh, initial acceleration to top speed. What I mean by that is the posture is always strong. The, the pelvis is always neutral. They always have great front side recovery. The thigh is never really trailing far back behind them. They're always getting uh, an aggressive kind of raising of the thigh up in front of the body and then an aggressive downstroke towards the ground. It's always cock the hammer, strike the nail. And then they're always stiff upon ground contact, landing on the ball of the foot and, and staying stiff from the ground up all the way through through the contact phase. Now, obviously, when they're accelerating, they're leaning in, and when they're top speed, they're totally upright. But if you take the body angle out of it, the mechanics are really, really similar. Yeah, the leg action goes from being piston-like during acceleration to more circular during top speed. But what I noticed as I worked with these elite sprinters, both on the treadmill where it was only top speed, and then on the track where it was acceleration and top speed, the overall strategy doesn't change. They just naturally transition from that leaning in acceleration mechanics with more piston-like recovery. And then at about five to 10 yards, the leg action just naturally becomes more and more circular, but everything else basically stays the same. So a long-winded answer to your question, what do I look for? Top speed, upright neutral posture, front side recovery with high knee lift, a real whip from the hip to steal a Franz Bosch term. So they get that thigh up in front of them about 70, 80 degrees. And then they really whip that sucker down towards the ground, the cock, the hammer, strike the nail. When they, when they strike the ground, it's, you know, basically underneath them. Um, and it's rigid on the ball, of the foot, and then nothing collapses during ground contact. And as soon as the foot comes off the ground, they reverse the thigh so that the so that, that that swing leg is immediately punching up in front of them. So it's 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 pretty pretty much the same thing. And you know what I've noticed with my developmental athletes is if they lose those mechanics, any of those mechanics, posture, front side recovery, stiff ground contact, if they lose that in steps one, two, or three, they can't regain that in top speed. So it's something that you know really has to be set from initial acceleration to occur at top speed. Yeah, awesome. So when you, like you mentioned earlier, you know, top end is very neurological and ground contact times are under a tenth of a second. So are these qualities you're talking about, are they, are they trainable? Um, and if so, kind of what are your kind of go-to methods to improve max velocity? Yeah, uh, they definitely are trainable. Um, you know, I, my, my favorite thing to do is, uh, you know, basically just use a free lap, especially with the, the athletes where I'm either personally training them or working with them in small groups and just time on a regular basis, just 10 or 20 yard splits. Um, and, and you can see those flying 10s or flying 20s just come down over the course of, you know, an 8, 12, 16 week training session. And, um, you know, as far as training methods, I think it really differs depending on you know, who you're working with. But, but for developmental and intermediate athletes, first of all, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you just got to run fast or run fast. So basically get them going at full speed two or three times a week. Um, there's no plyometric out there where you're on and off the ground in less than 0.15 seconds. And I love plyometrics in my mind. You got to have them in your training program. 
but it's the nature of the leg action where regardless of the plyo drill, you can't get a ground contact less than 0.15. So for running, even an average field sport athlete is on and off the ground in 0.12 of a second. And as you just said, you get to, you know, if you look at good running populations, they're on and off the ground in less than a tenth of a second or even 0.09 or 0.08. So running is, in my mind, the highest neural drill there is, high-speed sprinting. So, so the first thing I'll do is just get them running fast on a pretty regular basis. Um, second drill I, I like to do uh, is what I call technical buildups. And so technical buildups are like a 20 or 30 yard fly-in zone where essentially they're going from a, a 60 or 70% jog at the start. And by the time they hit the, the 20 or 30 yard mark, they're at full speed. And then they're doing a 20 or 30 yard fly at full speed or, or very close to full speed where you're giving them one technical cue to focus on. So the entire drill ends up being somewhere between 40 to 60 yards, you know, in, in length. So it's maybe a 20 yard fly in with a, with a 20 yard top speed zone, or it's like a 30 yard fly in with a 30 yard top speed zone. And the technique cues that I'll give them to focus on rep one, it's typically posture. So all they're doing is thinking about running tall with, with kind of, you know, belt buckle forward type of pelvic position um, to making sure that uh, their posture is good when they're running at top speed. Number two, sometimes I'll give them, um, you know, an, an arm cue to think about if they have really poor upper body mechanics, but sometimes I won't. Number three, um, we'll uh, have the athlete focus on leg mechanics. So front side recovery, essentially, as soon as the foot's off the ground, smashing that thigh forward. Number four, ground contact. So just making sure that the laces are up to the sky so that they're always landing on the ball of the foot. And so as soon as the, the foot comes off the ground, that they're not, you know, really running like a ballerina with the toe pointed down behind them, but rather with the, the laces snapping up each, each run. So I like to use these at the very end of the dynamic warm-up, right, uh, right before my athlete goes into the top speed um, sprinting or training for the day. So it's kind of a it's not only a technical warm up, but it also kind of gets their motor system in, in gear to run really fast as well. I've had good success with those in terms of correcting mechanics while also serving as a neural stimulus. Um, and then I think for, for elites, you know, and I haven't coached that many elites. I've more served as kind of a, a biomechanist or biomechanical consultant, but they're, they're such a thoroughbred, such a, uh, another animal. I, I think as far as, you know, what's, uh, what the next step is for them probably is something um, in addition to the, the, the drills that we already talked about. And most elites that I know of are already doing those sort of drills. But I, I think it probably is adding in some sort of, of overspeed. But, but that's pure, pure speculation right now. I think we'll have to see kind of how that, how that goes. So. <laughs> During that, you mentioned the arms, and arms is often another one that I'm really interested in. What do you think the role of the arms is? Is it if the arms are, are off in terms of technically wise, is that really a, a big factor in terms of detrimental to speed, or is it just a thing, something that kind of occurs naturally if you're running fast? And wh where does the arms play in, in your mind? Yeah, um, so great question again. I, I think, you know, the, the arms from a biomechanical standpoint – strictly serve to counterbalance the legs. So, you know, obviously as your left leg pumps forward, your right arm pumps forward, and, and that makes sure that you don't run in circles or you don't spin in circles. So I, I use the arms when I'm coaching mostly as an indicator of, you know, is there anything going wrong from a, a torsional control standpoint, i.e. is the athlete struggle to, to control the rotary forces that are occurring around the center of mass, or is there something going on um, with, with the legs down the chain. So I, 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 use, I usually look at the arms mostly just to, to use them as a, an analysis tool for the legs and the rest of the body. But I will say I do a, a minimal amount of coaching of the arms. Number one, a lot of athletes just like it. They feel like, well, we do you know, a fair amount of leg mechanics works. And they know, you know, shouldn't we be doing something for the arms? So just to kind of make sure we're addressing, you know, every aspect of it and, and check the boxes. And number two, and this is somewhat laughable, but it speaks to my private sector background as a coach. 
some some parents, if they're paying for private training, they might not know anything about running mechanics, but if they see their little Jimmy or Johnny running with arms that cross the body, they know that that's not right. And so if they pay you to work with them for 12 weeks and that's still not fixed, they, uh, they know that something, something's up. So, so sometimes it's good for aesthetic reasons only. And, and, you know, maybe you can laugh and say, well, that's not a good reason to, to coach it. But I guess, uh, you know, my first five or six years I was working in the private sector. And, and so that was something we, we were concerned with. So I, uh, to wrap up on the arms, I do a very minimal amount of technique work, I would say, for the arms. Maybe two to three minutes at the beginning of any given session, just working on making sure, you know, the arm drive is relatively uh, straight back and forth and relatively powerful driving from the shoulder. And maybe we'll do kind of one technical buildup where, uh, where, we're, where we're working on upper body technique. Awesome. Yeah, I know where you're coming from in the private sector with the, the parents there and those <laughs> little things, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's a real thing in the private sector. So let's go to now strength training when it comes to uh, speed, whether it be acceleration and max velocity. You know, I, I think, you know, me background in strength conditioning, many strength conditioning coaches think, you know, I see this all the time, to get faster, get stronger. Um, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, then if you talk to track coaches, they'll say, you know, max uh, strength in the weight room has little, you know, relationship to, to you know, top end sprinting speed, especially as the older the athlete or more experienced the athlete. So what's your thought on strength training and getting stronger for different levels of athletes and different phases, acceleration versus top end sprinting speed? Yeah, I love this question. I think it's a really interesting topic. And, and per most good questions, the answer is, you know, it all depends and the truth lies somewhere in between. So I do think that Max strength, um, and, and my favorite mode is the trap bar deadlift for, for any sort of max strength uh, exercise. I do think that max strength has a role in speed development, um, particularly if you're dealing with developmental and intermediate athletes. I think when you're talking strength and power, there are certain levels of um, standards or thresholds that, that need to be met. And that until those strength thresholds are met, that there will be improvements in speed that come from getting stronger relative to body mass. And again, the getting stronger relative to body mass, that, that last part of the phrase is really key because if you're getting stronger, but it, it's accompanied by non-functional hypertrophy and the athlete's getting stronger, but they're also getting heavier. Well, you know, Newton's laws tells us that that's not really going to help their, their speed development. But if you can get them stronger relative to how much they weigh, I think that's going to have uh, a huge benefit for, for novice and intermediate. Do you have certain strength standards you want athletes to meet? You know, anecdotally. So there is a little bit of research out there that if you're looking at the back squat, kind of, you know, two times body weight is the magic number. Um, if you're looking at the, the deadlift, that two times body weight is good, two and a half times body weight is really good, and three times body weight is great. Um, I can only speak to the deadlift numbers. Uh, and again, that is purely anecdotal. And, and I wouldn't want any of the coaches listening to this to take it as hard and fast rules. I, I have, you know, working with the trap bar deadlift, noticed that once an athlete gets above kind of two times body weight and, and even more to our, towards two and a half times body weight, that, that some good benefits come about. There's been some pretty good review articles that have come out in the last year or two and I'm blanking on them uh, off the top of my head that they would give, you know, the, the listeners kind of an overview of, of what the, the standards out there would be. From a conceptual standpoint, I do think that, you know, getting stronger relative to body mass is important. I also think that the coaches who are on the other end of the spectrum who work with athletes more on the elite side of things. Yeah. At a certain point, if you can back squat probably two and a half times body weight, if you can deadlift three times body weight, continuing to do those exercises and really pushing max, max strength in the weight room isn't going to transfer much to the, to the track at that point. Once you've hit that relative strength, then you're going to get diminishing returns. I, I think that's just kind of the, the way it goes from a physical standpoint. Um, so I think it all depends on, on the, the athlete that you're working with. Um, when, it, when it relates to, you know, kind of strength exercises versus power exercises and which, um, which type of exercises transfer better to which 
um, phase of the sprint. You know, I, I think that generally speaking, if you look at acceleration, it's more concentric in nature. Uh, the ground contact times are longer, typically around two tenths of a second, plus or minus 0.05 for the first few steps of, of acceleration. Um, whereas, you know, if you look at top speed, obviously the ground contact times are faster, as we mentioned. It's much more reactive strength in nature. So I think we need to keep those qualities in mind. Um, but I also think that from my mind, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter because I'm always trying to train the all around athlete. So I'm always going to include both of those, you know, types of training in my weight room sessions, because whether I'm working with a 100 meter sprinter or whether I'm working with a soccer player, I mean, yeah, the 100 meter sprinter definitely has a longer top speed phase and they hit that on a more regular basis. But my soccer player is going to get to a high percentage of top speed. You know, I, I think that's one kind of statistic that's thrown around there too much is that soccer, lacrosse, our team sports are all about acceleration. Well, you know, by the time they hit 10 yards, they're at 90% of their top speed. I'm going to be working a lot of top speed and acceleration with both my field sport athletes and my sprinters. Therefore, in the weight room, I'm going to want to work both types of qualities. I'm going to work, uh, you know, heavy strength training through the use of trap bar deadlift with both types of athletes. I'm going to work Olympic lift variations with both type of athletes. I happen to be preferential to the hang clean and the power clean, especially the hang clean and the hang clean variations. I'm going to be working a variety of plyometrics with all of those athletes. And in particular, with my field sport athletes, I'm going to be working plyometrics, you know, in, in all three planes, sagittal, transverse, and frontal. So, um, again, a little bit of a long-winded answer, but I guess I would say I, I believe in – all of those types of training. I think that I believe in them for both phases of the sprint. And I believe that, um, you know, it, it does differ depending on which type of athlete you're working with, but for everybody up to the kind of the cream and the crop, cream of the crop, I think that, that strength training is going to have a transfer. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It's always interesting to see, yeah, like you said, basketball, soccer, lacrosse, even football to an extent, they're purely acceleration, but those game changing plays are all max velocity. Um, if you can prove your max velocity, you're going to prove kind of your lower level of acceleration. So it's easy to run at that acceleration with less energy. And then also you talk about the hamstring pulls are so huge now that maybe because they're never exposed to that neurological of top end sprinting speed or the hamstrings ever get exposed to that top end sprinting speed is a reason we're seeing a lot of these hamstring pulls in many sports. Yeah, I'd like to touch on that briefly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a super biased person, just given my background. I think that top speed sprinting is just the, the best drill that can be done. Now, of course, it has to be built into a periodized program appropriately. You're not going to take an average Joe with no physical preparation background and have him do top speed sprinting from, from day one, right? Of course, he'd, he'd injure himself. But that if it's, if it's built in appropriately – you know, it, it's just the best stimulus that can be provided. There's never a situation where you're getting a higher rate of force application, peak forces of four to five times body weight and, you know, near a tenth of a second. There's just no other drill where you can do that. I think, you know, it, it is a stimulus that potentially prevents against those hamstring injuries and, and other type of soft tissue injuries as opposed to causes them. And, you know, I, I think, um, as you just said, yeah, athletes don't always reach, you know, absolutely 100% of top speed in a game situation if they're field sport athletes, but the plays that, that break the games are the ones where they do reach that top speed. And in my mind, a hugely misunderstood concept is that field sport athletes reach a, above 90% of their top speed a large percentage of the time. If you, if you do kind of a velocity curve breakdown of field sport athletes, they are at 90% of top speed or greater by 10 to 15 yards of a linear sprint. And so that's top speed training. They're upright. They are moving. That is no longer acceleration in my mind, anything from, from 10 to 15 yards on, on forward. So I think that's something that potentially in, you know, in the coaching community, we have to, to shift our thinking on a little bit. Yeah. I think that's a, a track and field concept where that is transferred to the sports is that, you know, track and field athletes purposely, you know, don't reach max velocity till 50, 60 meters. Exactly. The race model, 
where, like you said, team sport athletes are reaching it 10, 15, 20 yards in their sprint. And that, when you realize that, those distances occur a lot of times in your team sport athletes. A hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. The, the hundred meter model and the, the velocity percentages that we've become familiar with, with that, that's the hundred meters and nothing else. And as much as I love the hundred, if we take those percentages and say, well, they're not hitting top speed to 50 meters, it in no way translates to our, our field sport athlete who's absolutely at a hundred percent of top speed by 20 to 30 meters uh, or yards. And, and they're nearly at that, you know, earlier on in a sprint. So again, just uh, not to belabor that point, but just something to keep in mind when we're working with our athletes. So when you're training week, where do you fit? So you got, so you, you're, you work as a, a strength issue coach, you help out at a, at a college. Where do you guys place your max velocity within your week? Yeah. So um, I'd like to, to throw a shout out to my partner in crime, uh, coach Corey Waltz, who's over at, at Haverford college, um, which is a division three school in suburban Pennsylvania. Corey's uh, one of the best coaches around. I've known him for about 10 years and we have a great uh, coaching partnership. So I'm a volunteer assistant there. I assist with some of the speed and agility um, sessions as well as uh, developing the progressions. And uh, the way Corey has his training week uh, structured with, with his team sport athletes and their off season phase is one day a week is acceleration and multi-directional speed. And the other day of the week is max velocity and, and fitness at the end of that. Um, so that's the way we've structured it the last uh, two off seasons that I've been associated with him. I also think that you can just as well structure it where you have linear speed one day, you know, combining acceleration and, and top speed and, and multi-directional speed another day, which I know is very common, you know, at other colleges and also in, you know, in the private sector. In my mind, either, either structure works. Um, so I, I think it really comes down to, um, you know, kind of just how it best fits into your off-season program as a whole and, and how it fits in with your, your strength training and how many times a week your athletes are, are training. So, um, but with that being said, the way that we've done it at, at Haverford, and again, you know, Corey oversees all of this, is that um, with, our, uh, with our acceleration and, and multi-directional speed, um, we've, uh, we've kind of added in a, a lot more of what we, uh, what we call kind of a, a compete and then a technical and then a compete model. And I think this is maybe bleeding into our next question a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, it lends itself perfectly. And so what we do on, on both our acceleration agility day and on the max velocity day is try to get our athletes engaged by really having them do competitive drills. So this is anything from tag drills or, um, you know, chase drills, if we're working on linear speed, or it's, you know, different types of reactive agility, mirror drills, if, if we're working multidirectional speed, and we, we sandwich this so that the first component of our session after dynamic warmup, obviously, is a compete situation. And we don't offer too much coaching. And what I mean by that is we're not doing too much um, mistake correction in that first competition section. We're merely setting up the rules of the drill, if you will, and then letting it flow. We kind of borrowed this concept based off of um, Lee Taft and, and some of his ideas, and it really worked well for us this, this past fall. And so rather, instead of offering a ton of hands-on corrections, we're looking for, okay, what are some of the common mistakes that the athletes were making? So if we're just doing like a simple chase drill for acceleration, you know, one partner's in, in front in a push-up position, the, the other partner's in five yards behind in a speed stance, and they get up and they, you know, they sprint 20 yards. If we look at both of those athletes accelerate in this competition setting, what mistakes are they making? Are they, you know, are they just spinning their wheels without really pushing? Are they, you know, um, not leaning in appropriately? Uh, or, or not having perfect posture. And so then in the next section, we try to fix those in what we call a technical section. So then we're taking the athletes over to the wall and, and doing, you know, maybe three or four minutes of wall drills or doing partner resisted marches or, you know, working on our A march and our mm -hmm. A skip. So any of the mistakes that have been made in that initial section and the athletes are more prone to make those mistakes because they're in a competition scenario. So we can really see them. Then we correct those in the technical, technical section. And then we finish with kind of a more advanced progression of that competition drill. 
and hopefully get some improvement on that initial mistake that was made. So it was kind of a whole part whole type of model, if you will. And the other benefit of it is that um, it allows the athletes really to get fired up. I mean, you never get faster <laughs> sprinting in a, you know, in a training session than when you do when the athletes are just um. all out competing. So it accomplishes, you know, those couple of things. It allows us to see mistakes and fix them. It allows the athletes to get engaged with the drill and allows us to, to really get them running fast. And so we use that for both kind of the acceleration uh, and top speed drills that we do. And it also allow, uh, we also do it with the, the multidirectional speed that we do. So for that, for that technical component, are you going in to that training session with um, a technical model in mind or do you just – do you react to what you see? And then from there on the fly, we're going to go to this drill because this is what we see the mistake being made. Or do you go in with a, an idea, I want to work on posture today? Um, or do you just pick out the biggest, the low-hanging fruit in terms of technical error, and then you address that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, another awesome question. Uh, a, a little bit of both. We definitely go in with, you know, kind of uh, some planned out drills for, for what we're going to do based on what we expect to see yep. as common errors. And uh, to a certain extent, you know, I think experienced coaches already, already know going in, you know, what the common errors are going to be. But with that being said, if we see something uh, unexpected in the initial compete, then, then we'll perhaps on the fly make a, you know, make a switch in that technical section and, you know, and, and make that correction. So, so a little bit of, a little bit of both. And, and this was really new for us this fall. This was something we redesigned over the summertime. So um, this was, and again, these are, these are Corey's athletes at Haverford College who are just incredible, uh, incredible division three athletes, both in terms of physically and also just in terms of being great kids who are hard workers. And these were the spring sport athletes we were, we were working with. Um, so it was the, uh, you know, it was the, the lacrosse, the softball, the baseball, et cetera. And so um, they did a great job of this. And, and I think we'll probably tweak it a little bit more moving forward. But, but yeah, we, we went into it with a, an idea of what we were looking for and then also switched it up on the fly a little bit. So. Yeah, I know you've touched on a, a number of things already, but is there anything else that maybe you're doing this year? that is different than saying years past. I know you already touched upon a couple of things that what you just addressed are many of those factors, but anything else that you'd like to touch upon? Yeah. Something that I think I'm um, going to do a little bit more of with my private clients. I, I train a few kind of just in, uh, you know, small, small group or one-on-one -on -one settings on the side. Um, and uh, a few of the, the football players that I'll be working with as it relates to just kind of pure linear speed training. I think I'm going to try a, a little bit of a, of a different approach with working on the start and um, where I literally in the initial off season phase, don't progress to step two until step one is absolutely perfect. And, and maybe that's a, maybe that's a no brainer to a certain extent and, and something I should have been doing a, a decade ago and, and haven't. But uh, over the last two or three years, I think, you know, there's been some times where just step one, I haven't been getting as much complete extension, as much full push, and, and things haven't been 100% perfect. Uh, and I've still proceeded to, you know, to steps two and three or to a 10-yard dash or to a 40. And then, you know, in, in later on in the spring or in midsummer looked back and said, well, you know, the whole race model is pretty good and, and the athletes made really good improvements, but step one still isn't quite where I want it and had to go back and fix things up. And so I think, especially for, for those coaches who are in cold weather climates where you're indoors, maybe with limited space, which is, you know, in Philadelphia area, unfortunately, from January through, through March, I'm going to be working in a space that's basically uh, 10 yards long with some of my, you know, one-on-one -on -one athletes. So really just taking that time to focus on, uh, okay, if we're working on 40-yard dash training, let's get that stance and that step one absolutely perfect. And when that step one's perfect, only then will we move on to step two. And so, again, you know, maybe that's something that all other good coaches are already doing out there, and I'm 10, yards, 10, uh, 10 years behind the curve on that one. But I'm excited just to see how kind of that, that perfect race, if you will, that perfect race development will, will work out. So. Awesome. Well, let's, can let's wrap up here for our last two questions. 
give us kind of three books that have kind of had a big influence on you and your career or changed the way you look at or approach coaching. Yeah, I'm going to give you the nerdiest answer of all time here. So they're not even really going to be books. So the, the first one is, uh, so Peter Wayans uh, kind of famous study that came out on running mechanics and forces in the year 2000. And the reason I bring that up is uh, I mentioned my dad as a speed coach and I was 19 years old when that article was published. Um, and so my dad happened to read that article and contacted Peter Wayand and said, okay, what are the coaching applications of this? And so not only did it change me as an athlete, as far as what me and my dad were, were working on from a speed standpoint, but also it led to this entire email discussion between my father and, and Peter, which ultimately set my entire career path, uh, because, uh, I ended up contacting Peter, um, literally a decade after that in 2010 or close to it, and then moving down there to Dallas to do my doctoral studies. So uh, as weird as that is to say that a, a five page or 10 page publication changed my life, it, it did both as an athlete and then ultimately set my career path. That's, so that's, crazy. A, that's a crazy link there. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. It really went back to when I was 19 and then now I'm 36. So you never know how life works. Number two, again, this is going to be a ridiculous answer. Um, but the NSEA Essentials textbook. So the reason I say that is my first coaching job, I was hired at 25. Uh, I didn't have a degree in the field. I was a psychology major at Swarthmore College. I didn't have my CSCS. I got hired by Summit Sports Training Center in Westchester, conditional upon getting the CSCS within six months. I had to basically teach myself out of the book, which was no problem. That was just the rules of the game. Bought the book, cracked it open. I mean, I was in love from page one. So I just knew like upon opening that book that this is the field for me and this is going to be my career path moving forward. Uh, and so, you know, hey, it's a textbook and I think we've all probably read parts of it, but I, I was just in love from, from moment one of reading it and read it cover to cover. And the, and the same goes for the third book. <laughs> and again, just, just revealing my inner nerd here, but, but Ralph Mann's Mechanics of Sprinting, Sprinting and Hurdling, which for anyone interested in speed, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, just got my hands on the on the latest edition, which is 2013 version. Um, I think, you know, there, there's so much practical uh, knowledge that's in there. And whether you're a strength and conditioning coach or a track coach or whatever, if you're looking to improve your your knowledge base on how to teach speed, but also just under understand the the mechanics underlying speed, that's the one. So. I know some coaches get on these podcasts and they give really great, like motivational books and philosophical books. And, 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 uh, you know, that's just, that's just me. I'm a speed nerd. So, so there you go. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Now let's go. You got three people, any three people have ever lived dead or alive that can bring to dinner with you. Who would they be? Yeah. Uh, I'll stick on the same, same theme here. So I'm a, uh, I'm a coach at heart and also, I guess, a scientist. So I'll go with Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and John Wooden to kind of cover my bases. So, you know, uh, who would you rather have, the, the, uh, the forefather of, uh, you know, movement mechanics and, and all of physics in motion as it applies to athletics and Isaac Newton, evolutionary biology, and, and you know, what we understand about kind of biological design in Charles Darwin. Um, and then John Wooden with everything from motivation to teaching skills. Uh, and, you know, I'm also a motor learning uh, teacher as well as being a biomechanist. So I think if you bring those three together and you just let them talk, you'd be a better coach at the end of dinner time. Yeah, that, that would be one hell of a dinner. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it was, that's a cool question to think about, uh, yeah. you know, a, <laughs> if only, I guess. So, so what, uh, Ken, where can our listeners follow you on social media? Yeah, you can uh, either follow me just uh, on, on Ken Clark on Facebook or on uh, on Twitter. My handle is uh, at Ken Clark Speed. Awesome. Well, Ken, this has been awesome. You did a great job. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy schedule and, and sharing so much in-depth information with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, love what you're doing with this and, and really appreciate you having me on uh, and, and happy holidays. Great, Ken. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. Join me in thanking Ken for taking the time today for giving us about an hour-long uh, podcast and interview. I mean, all I can say is, wow, what, what great information was shared. Um, truly, a, truly a great interview with Ken today. I learned a ton, and I'm sure all of you uh, had a ton of takeaways as well. So 
Join me with thank you, Ken, and please thank him on social media of your choice. Share this podcast so others can hear the great um, information Ken had to share today. And until next time, we'll see you on the other side.